Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Welcome to International Women's Day 2022 and to our special webinar on behalf of the Association of Child and Adolescent Mental Health. My name is Professor Bernadka Dubitska. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Journal. I'm also a consultant in child psychiatry and an academic. It's, it's a difficult time to bring you this day, particularly when there are so many women and girls and children suffering throughout the world in war-torn zones and particularly in Ukraine as we speak. And this highlights the importance of International Women's Day all the more and arguably gender inequality is perhaps one of the greatest inequalities worldwide. According to the latest figures that I've seen, only about a quarter of parliamentary seats in governments throughout the world are held by women. And you do wonder during these troubled times whether perhaps we make a better case of peace for more women and representation in parliament and governments around the world. However, the focus of the webinar today is going to be around careers in child and adolescent mental health. I'd just like to think back very briefly to when I first started on my career in child and adolescent mental health. That was back in 1983 when I applied to medical school and I walked into my one and only interview and the very first question that was asked of me was whether I thought whether as a woman and a doctor I could also be a mother and, and, a, and a career woman. Obviously there was only one answer to that but if you fast forward 10 years from then I, I managed to get my very first research fellow post about which I was very excited and as soon as I informed my male professor at the time but I wasn't that pregnant I was informed I could no longer have that job. However, that did change. I would like to say that 20, 30 years after that time, things have improved significantly, but I'm not really sure that is the case. Um, but we've got an esteemed panel, a huge representative, wide variety of perspectives from both academia and from clinical practice today, and we'll see what our panel um, have to say. Um, I would like to point out, however, though, fast forward to 2021 last year, the British Medical Association here in the UK published um, their investigation into gender inequality across the medical profession here in the UK. And very troublingly, that could have been written back in the 1970s because of the level of sex discrimination, sexual harassment that was depicted within that report within my own medical profession was shocking to say the least. And similarly, we provided a link to you for a European study of academics across Europe published back in 2018, which showed that although the, although the majority of graduates were in fact female, the, the proportion of professors at a senior level were a very tiny proportion of that. So I think we still do have a long way to go, but let's hear what our panel have to say. Um, I'll let the panel introduce themselves one by one, and we'll start with Dr. Gordana Malavich, who is our chief executive. Um, so Gordana, I'd really like you to answer our first question within two minutes. Um, what strides do you think have been made within our profession to break the gender bias? Um, and what more can be done to try and overcome the barriers? Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm currently the chair of ACAM, and uh, I join you all in celebrating this important date. As a doctor and psychiatrist working in child mental health services, I, I think that uh, we have been very fortunate in that uh, we have had many equal opportunities in accessing our careers and progressing in our careers, but there's still many uh, inequalities. And I want today to focus on the gender pay gap. And we have this excellent independent review into gender gaps in medicine. And even as recently as uh, December 2020, when this report was published, I should say it was chaired by Professor Dame Jane Dacre, uh, and produced some wonderful uh, materials and results. Women hospital doctors, uh, even uh, only a year and a half, two years ago, were earning on average less than men by about um, 18%. And this went across, uh, these were hospital doctors, this went across primary care and uh, community services. And why was this? Well, I think it's the underrepresentation of women in the highest paid positions, the grades and specialities. So, um, you know, women often um, look after others, uh, primarily look after children, take time out of their careers. Uh, they're uh, in, in posts which are less than full time, 
uh, medical careers haven't even evolved to accommodate for this. And uh, of course, um, you know, they are, they seem to be segregated into these particular posts right from the beginning of their careers. So what do we need to do? What do we need to change still? I think we need to understand uh, that this uh, gender pay gap exists. But we need to bear in mind the um, intersectionality of different protected characteristics, that is the race and disability when considering these things. And we need to support doctors, we need to support them, particularly when they're having children and caring responsibilities. For instance, you know, in mixed sex couples, men should be encouraged to take time off work. There should be enhanced pay for shared parental leave. Uh, you know, poor behavior, stereotypical attitudes need to be tackled. And finally, because I know I'm limited in time, I must say, and I've been saying this for the last 40 years of my career, more good quality, affordable nurseries everywhere, because childcare is at the crux of some of, of, of the, the, the career pathways of uh, women. So um, I will finish there for the time being, uh, Benatka, and uh, once again, thank you for inviting me for my response. Thank you very much, Gordana. Same question for you, Cathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Silva. I'm treasurer of ACAM, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I began my training at Harvard more than 40 years ago. So, I mean, I can really talk about the ancient days, and it was very, very different. There were no tenured female professors. My class of entering people studying educational psychology was less than a third female. Um, and uh, my tale to match um, Gordana's is that my head of my uh, study group, my, my year group, said to me privately over his third glass of wine, you know, studying developmental psychology, there are two kinds of scholars. And he said, they're the ones who just want to study the process. They don't care if it's a flatworm or a gibbon, you know, or a dog or a, mu a muscle. Um, and then there are others who really want to study child development to make the world better for children. And he said, you're that latter group and you're really important. My wife is like that. The other ones, I mean, they're the ones that care about papers, care about their career, but it's so good to have you because you're in that group of developmentalists who really want to make the world better for children. And so it was an awful introduction to my degree and I determined that I would show him that you could do both. So yes, Certainly from the dark ages, things have changed a lot in educational psychology. Um, two quick points. One is that as professions become highly feminized, they then get lower pay and lower status. This has happened in the United Kingdom in educational psychology, which now enormously has been taken over by women. And so we have to be very, very careful because pay has gone down and status has gone down. I think it's true in the United Kingdom in GP. Many of you in medicine will know that's true there. So we have to be really careful about the feminization of professions and then careful to guard the pay, not to have the pay gap. Um, and I'll end, I um, hadn't thought about this at all, but Gordana's statement about childcare. Um, as a graduate student, I started the very first childcare center at Harvard um, because I knew that that was the secret for us having the hours. We needed the hours to write the papers, deal with referee comments, you know, all of the the work that we academics do, but we need really good childcare. So thank you for bringing it up, Gordana. So guard the profession, those professions that get feminized, be really careful, and then always have really good childcare. So I'll pass on. Thank you very much, Cathy. I'll move over to our mid middle career academics and clinicians now. So Francesca, can we hear your take? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm um, Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at King's College London, and I'm a researcher, not a clinician. Um, I think things have changed a lot. Um, a lot of my work is on autism, and we fight gender bias there in recognition of autism. But in terms of academia, I think things have got a lot better. Certainly when I compare to when I had my children 20 years ago, 
um, it was sort of you know, met with shock and horror that uh, you would go and have children, let alone three children, and think you're going to have a career as well. Um, but I think now with uh, explicit commitment to family friendly working hours, um, much better maternity leave arrangements and expectations of how long you'll take for maternity leave, still a lot to be on paternity leave, as mentioned. Um, I think things have got a lot better and there's a lot more honesty about how difficult it can be to juggle having a career and having your family and that your family are really important. Um, I think things that help um, are, uh, I think visibility is really important for all aspects of diversity and inclusion. So um, uh, where I work, we have a permanent exhibition of photos of all the female professors um, and that's right outside the biggest lecture theatres. So it's very visible and I think that little thing actually does make a difference. Having more female heads of department has really helped, but of course we've still got a lot of battles. There's still too many white privileged uh, males in positions of authority and not enough diversity of all types. Um, and I think that uh, it obviously is very tough for early career academics, um, job insecurity and fellowships and so on, uh, and we're still rewarding people working ludicrous hours that just aren't sustainable with any kind of, of personal life, let alone family life. Um, apart from visibility, I think that making processes really transparent uh, and open the advertising opportunities is very important. We really have to do away with the, the old boy system and just tapping somebody on the shoulder to do the next job because they look like you or they speak like you. Um, and also having open processes to encourage people who don't necessarily shout the loudest. So we have an annual process by which we go through all the academics uh, in our department to consider them for promotion and to suggest what they need to do to be ready for promotion. And that means it's not just the overconfident uh, or the bullish people who go forward for promotion. Everybody is, is thought about and is um, encouraged. And likewise, prizes and awards outside. We have a, a committee that actually actively thinks about who could be put forward for different awards. So again, the modest and the humble don't get left behind. And often women and others are very modest and humble. So uh, I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francesca. And moving on to one of our international colleagues, Rhonda, can you introduce yourself and let's hear your take? Hello, I'm Rhonda Boyd. I am um, a clinical psychologist. I do both clinical work as well as research um, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Penn Perlman School of Medicine. I wanna to come today from the perspective of being a black woman and a psychologist in an academic medical center. And so when we think about intersectionality and what that brings, um, one of the things, um, as the previous panelists has, have mentioned, I've noticed the change over my career. Um, when I first went to um, graduate school in a clinical psychology program, um, there were very few women faculty at, in my department. Um, although most of the graduate students were um, women. And actually, I was the only Black woman clinical um, faculty, um, clinical um, graduate student at that time. And so fast forward to now at my institution where I'm at, um, continue that most of the trainees, most of the um, staff and faculty are women. Um, one of the things is that both my chair at the Children's Hospital as well as the University of Pennsylvania are women of color and the CEO of our hospital is also a woman. And so we see those strikes. Um, as the previous panel has said, it's still not enough. There's still areas in which um, women um, do not get promoted at each different level. Um, one of the things um, that has been noted is that the American uh, Medical Co Association of uh, Medical Colleges showed that um, among women faculty, Black women represent 5% um, in the United States. And so that's a very small number. Um, and so in many ways, um, in academia, um, I am viewed almost as a unicorn in some ways people say that um, I'm invisible in a lot of ways and then I'm hyper visible in many ways. And so these things come together that is still dealing with gender bias as well as racial bias. And these issues still need to be addressed. I think particularly that um, there needs to be institutional changes sort of at the basic because um, many of these institutions weren't at, at developed um, for women um, when they started or women or people of color. And so these things have to change systematically within 
at my institution, we have um, something called Focus in which they do conferences and um, talks about issues that affect women. Um, and I always thought that they were helpful. They talk about um, pay equity, negotiating things, um, all of these issues that um, are brought up here. And those things are helpful. And early in my career, they actually did a clinical trial in which they put all the women faculty by department into two um, groups and we got you know, leadership training and also we um, received um, writing group and then there was a control group. And so they looked to see whether that helped retain women faculty. And so that was actually a positive experience in being because I was in the intervention group, so that was helpful. But I think we need to do these type of programs to be able to retain people because we know the pipeline is there, but we lose so many women along the way. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Good to hear some progress, but a long way to go, as you say. So moving on to Pravitha, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Pravitha Padale, uh, again, researcher, not clinician, uh, based at UCL in London. Um, so I'm going to, again, all the things that have already been discussed, um, really important, and just wanted to add, I guess, some of the things that haven't been discussed. Um, so around Although sort of visibility has improved and, you know, across the last many decades, there are sort of female professors, female clinicians, um, sort of that, that change happening hides the sort of insidious nature of the, all the different biases and discrimination that still happen. So women are still less likely to be published in top journals, still less likely to be cited. Um, and all of these things also matter to our careers and equally also less likely to get funding, even when we have equally strong funding applications and there's lots of empirical evidence on these gaps. And so I think we've been discussing things around sort of what women can do, and obviously we can do a fair bit, but equally the systems are so sort of biased that I think sort of lots of focus around fixing the systems also need to be made. So for example, in my university, similar to what Rhonda was saying, you have women in leadership courses, especially for women faculty. Um, but these courses completely ignore the fact that the system is broke. So instead of training us, you know, you should be training everybody who runs the system rather than training us to be more like men so that we can succeed in a system that was designed by men. Um, so in the interest of storytelling, because everybody has uh, given us an example of a story in their career, I'm fairly early career. I've only got gotten my PhD in the last decade. Um, and my first ever grant, um, just, you know, by chance, the person who was the best person for the postdoctoral position was, was a male. And one of the senior male professors in the department raised the issue of whether I should be allowed to employ a male professor on the grant, sorry, a male postdoc on the grant, because as a young woman, it was very unlikely a man would take me seriously as a supervisor and mentor. So it'd be better for me to restrict the postdocs I was allowed to hire to females. Both being problematic in so many ways because it's not fair to the male postdocs or to me, but again, just highlighting that, and obviously this attitude only reflects the senior male professor's point of view, but again, quite openly. Uh, so I'd like to say, although like all these stories about it, things have changed, I'd argue not fast enough. Um, I grew up thinking, so my mom worked, my grandma worked, I come from a family of women who work, and I grew up thinking by the time I was an adult, the world would be more equal, at least the world of employment. And so it's been a rude shock to discover in my 20s and 30s that is completely not the case. Universities still have a 15% gender pay gap. Um, so it's sort of, I think my, my sort of thing would be to think about how the systems still need to change. And explicitly, I think the problem is sort of, we talk about women's equality one, once a year, and then for the 364 days afterwards, forget about it. Um, I think to actually have sea change, we'll have to constantly have, have it in the forefront of the systems we design and the systems we have. And um, lastly, just to say, also reflected in the science we do, where lots of the child mental health researchers, we know a gender, an enormous gender gap in the most common mental um, disorders appears in adolescents, where women are twice as likely as men to the life course to suffer from common mental health problems like depression, anxiety, and self-harm. However, com comparatively to the, to the size of the problem, sort of that much money doesn't go into these um, disorders, but equally, that much research isn't done to ask why. So we don't, we have very good high quality science to answer the question of why is it that women are 
having worse mental health in their teenage years and what can we do to sort of improve the world so that that doesn't happen um so again so i know we're meant to talk about our careers but equally i think the sort of gender bias in the world is reflected in the research we do and it would be something to work towards closing the gender gap in the research we do in mental health as well thank you thanks very much Rafita, and thanks for that anecdote if there's time afterwards maybe we can have a discussion around that because the question for me is what do women do when they're confronted with that kind of an attitude where do you take that where do you go with it and if there's time maybe we can come back to that later thank you very much so moving on to women who are just starting out on their careers now um so bethany would you like to introduce yourself Hi everybody. Um, first of all, I just want to say it's a huge honour to be here. So thank you so much to ACAM for putting on this event and inviting us all to speak. Um, yep, so my name's Beth. I'm a PhD student. I'm in my final year. I'm at the University of Bath um, and lots of my research looks at digital interventions and things for young people struggling with their mental health. Um, so to answer the question, I do think important steps have been taken in this field, as others have rightly said. Um, but again, I also agree that there is still a long way to go. I find myself um, in academia surrounded by so many inspirational and talented women, but notice that they are often missing from those higher level managerial or leadership roles. And of course, it goes even further for um, women of colour, disabled women, trans women, for example. So I think that does really need to be addressed. Um, and then also, I think the other issue is that women who are in those higher level positions still don't necessarily always have a great experience and are still subject to lots of discrimination. Um, for example, I, I read a tweet the other day from a woman who was in a meeting with all male colleagues and she said I think that she would bounce a ball or something every time one of them interrupted her and I think the men themselves were actually really surprised at how often they did it. So I think it's also important to acknowledge the role of unconscious gender biases um, and the impact that they have and I think really that reflects the, the wider standing of women in society more generally and sort of hints at the ingrained biases and discrimination and prejudice there is against women and um, sort of drilled in from a young age. And whilst that's a really big issue that needs to be tackled um, and seems a bit kind of overwhelming, there are obviously smaller things we can do on a day-to-day -day basis to really help women out. And I think that's things like making sure we cite more female authors when we're writing papers, making sure we're, you know, giving women funding, we're nominating them for awards and things like that. Anything that we can do really to make sure that women's achievements are recognised and their roles are respected as they deserve and, and rightly should be, and just that their voices are really amplified in this field, really. Thanks for the suggestions, Bethany, and also just thinking about how we can tackle unconscious bias as well. Maybe that's something we can come back to. Thank you very much. So, so moving on to Clara, another international panellist. Would you like to introduce yourself from Brazil, Clara? Thank you so much, Bernardica. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Clara Faria. I'm a junior doctor from Brazil and an aspiring academic child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, first of all, it's a huge honour to be here. So thank you so much once again for the invite. Um, Regarding uh, the advance, I, I do believe many advancements were made uh, in, in, in breaking the bias, especially when it comes to recruitment and um, especially when it comes to recruitment and also acknowledging the bias exists. So, for example, in my country, the number of women in medicine and in psychiatry grew significantly in the last decade. And now like the women doctors until the age of 29, which would be my group, they have outnumbered male doctors according to our latest medical census. Um, however, when we, again, uh, as was mentioned by uh, other colleagues in the panel, when we look at leadership positions and when, when we look at salary and we, when we look at uh, inter intersectionality, as Dr. Boyd mentioned and Pravita mentioned as well, um, there are still significant dis disparities, uh, especially in academia. And um, so, for example, when I was uh, beginning in research as an undergraduate trainee, I remember that I was looking for a professor to mentor me in the Department of Psychiatry at my university, and uh, there were simply no female faculty members there. So um, uh, I, I, I looked because I, I, I mean, I, I wanted uh, to be mentored by a female faculty because um, I always find for us juniors is very inspiring when we and when when we see female doctors and female researchers on, on those positions, but there, there simply weren't any. So um, I still believe we really have a long way to go in that area. 
And um, as Pravita mentioned, I really believe that to change that landscape, uh, we really need to adopt, uh, like the system needs to be fixed um, uh, instead of us constantly trying to adapt to a system that was not designed for us. So I really believe we need institutional support in this um, universities and trust. They, they need to adopt a conscious inclu inclusion culture and make the commitment to support and equip women to be in leadership positions. Uh, Professor Silva mentioned childcare. There's a really interesting study um, at MIT, I think, that showed that when they installed the childcare in campus, the women, women faculty positions almost doubled because um, we really uh, struggle with retention in that sense. So, uh, and especially for us that are very, very early career, um, when we see women conquering management positions, when we see women uh, as heads of department and when we see women as professors, it's, it's really, really inspiring. It's representativ representativity matters a lot. So yes, I think, um, I think that's it. <laughs> Over to you, Bernard. Thank you very much, Clara. And then lastly, we'll come to Gloria. Can we hear your take? Hi, so I'm Glory Chung. I'm currently a fourth year medical student at the University of York. I'm very grateful to be invited to this panel. And I think from my point of view, I think medicine has sort of like changed quite a bit and has come a long way from in gender inequality. I've done some research online, have, have looked at some news article and back in 20, um, back back 20 years ago, people were trying to impose a um, gender quota in medical school recruitment. I think that just, I think that just seems really frustrating to me. And I'm glad that didn't happen. And I think we went from like being a really male dominated profession to a profession that has a higher female to male ratio in medical school recruitment. But as others has mentioned, there is still not enough females in the top of the pyramid. And I think that's because females are traditionally seen as being the caretaker of the family and they need to like um, be responsible for childcare. And there is uh, a recent article written by a male doctor, I think, and he was talking about the, the gender sort of racial in medicine and how he find it concerning that there is more female than um, male in medical schools. And he explained that it's because um, female colleagues tend to leave the profession and or work part time as they approach a later stage of their career, which would mean it would decrease the number of doctors actually working in in probably the NHS. However, I, th I really I find this really frustrating. I think he's just really um, blaming the female colleague for this when I think we should actually try to restructure our whole profession, our whole profession in, in the medicine career and medicine sort of profession. It has been structured by mainly uh, men in the old days. And I think, um, I'm not sure if anyone has watched the latest BBC series, um, This Is Going To Hurt. And it talked about how, you know, a, a doctor, male, it's in a male's doctor perspective, but it talked about how he's affected by burnout. And it also talked about suicidal rates in doctors, which is quite high. And I think it's not only a female that is affected by the structure, it's also our male colleagues that's also affected. And I think we should make this, we should try to increase the number of, you know, part-time posts and try to increase childcare support for both female and male colleagues so that we could actually try to shift our um, societal norms to female being the only child caretaker to male also being the caretaker as well. And yeah, I think that's my sort of perspective on how gender bias is like in medicine as a young person. Thanks very much, Gloria. And as you say, everyone's entitled to work-life balance, aren't they? And we need that societal shift. Thank you. Right, so we'll move on to our second question and I'll start with Gordana again. Um, so what advice would you give to young women who are starting out in their careers? What are the key take-home messages? Over to you, Gordana. Thank you, Bernardka. As um, primarily a clinician and a manager, um, my take on this comes from, from my own perspective there. And um, what, what I think maybe goes across the genders and um, across all, all groups, but I think one needs to take on challenges 
uh, right from the beginning um, and to do so with confidence. You know, for instance, don't just go for secure um, setups, but go, go for underdeveloped services, build up, do leave your mark. Um, the, these are very rewarding um, sort of um, achievements and goals in, in one's career. Um, and I would say as a clinician um, that one must always bridge science and practice in whatever you do. The two are inseparable uh, in child and young people's mental health, and especially nowadays that we have uh, such a wealth of uh, research information um, and uh, can benefit from putting these uh, discoveries and findings into practice. So um, be a scientist um, uh, and a clinician at the same time. Uh, obviously, uh, unless one is subspecializing in particular areas. The other thing I would say is um, consider the larger context. One's got to think about the politics, the politics of the workplace, the politics um, of the environment within which one works. And that leads on to policy and influencing policy. Um, communicating with colleagues and the community and, and the public, extremely important. And we've seen how important that is during the pandemic. Um, and uh, overall, remain intellectually curious uh, in many areas, you know, have diverse interests, develop something outside the, the sort of area in within which you're working. Um, and, and think about that um, big picture from the outset. Um, I remember working really hard as a junior doctor, being uh, clinically overwhelmed day and night on call. You know, there were never enough beds for um, suicidal patients, for psychotic patients. Uh, my, my hospital colleagues would, would ring in the middle of the night and, you know, everybody was very grateful. But without reaching out uh, into the politics of, of the institution, of the hospital, of the community, of the people who commissioned our services, uh, nothing was going to change. And indeed, that, that has really helped me in my own career in, in, in terms of managing services and um, being there in, 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 in a sort of wider context. Thanks very much, Gordon, and um, thank you for those important points. I think that the issue about feeling the fear and taking up challenges is so important because so many women just don't put themselves forward. But they don't seem to have the same self-confidence as belief as many of our male counterparts and absolutely influencing policy is so important. So thank you for that. Cathy, can we have your words of wisdom next? Yeah. What I wish I'd known is it's all right to say no. And uh, I think... I'm not saying men say no in the male way, which is I'm too busy, I'm important. Of course, I cannot lead the curriculum reform working party because I'm too important. So I'm not proposing that we say no in that way. But if we really believe in the value of our work, I'm an academic, so it would be in the value of research, of publications um, and getting research grants. You then look at your time each week and each month and you realize what is reasonable in good citizen-like behavior for you to say yes to. So I'm not saying that we're gonna be like men and say, no, I'm so important. We're not so important. We want to do the good citizen work, but really keep a rein on it and do it in an appropriate way. And the way you can say no and feel confident is because you really believe that that grant application that you really must do in the next two months, that's really important and you're gonna do a good job. So my story is that for my first chair, uh, I went to the University of Warwick and the vice chancellor within three months sent me a letter, old fashioned letter, inviting me to be on the childcare committee for the university. And so one of my colleagues said, oh, that's a university committee. You've only been here three months. I wrote back within 24 hours. I'm very surprised that you asked me to join the child care committee. 
um, because I haven't expressed any interest in it at all, although it's important. Um, I would, however, be interested in the promotions committee. And within 24 hours, I was on the promotions committee. So for somebody who'd been for three months in a new job, it was a really important job that I got and I learned a lot. So it's say no appropriately, don't feel guilty. So learn how to manage your guilt that you've said no, because what you want to do, whatever it is, new, new developments in practice or new developments in research, that's what's really important. So keep that time for yourself. Don't do it in the mail way there. Right, really important advice. Thank you, Cassie. Say no, don't feel guilty and put yourself out there. Thank you very much. Um, Francesca, moving on to you. What, what would you like to say? Thank you. Um, so um, I, I think I was very lucky to have a really wonderful PhD supervisor who did very explicitly say and model that you could be an ambitious scientist and uh, a mother or parent. Um, and so I, I was really lucky in that way. Um, and I think that my advice would be to choose mentors and supporters, actively go and find mentors and supporters. And, and part of that's going to help with what Kathy just said very wisely, because it can be hard. You can feel that you're being selfish if you want to do this rather than that um, and want to turn down some helpful roles in order to do other helpful roles. But if you've got somebody who has your back, then they can say to you, no, it's not selfish. You must do that. It's important. And you can do the same for them or for your other colleagues. So I think that that's enormously helpful. Um, on the point of saying no, but also saying yes, as Gordana said, to, to do some ambitious things, to not be afraid to try. Uh, it's all right to try and to stumble. Um, but remember that if you take on something new, what are you going to drop? Because we otherwise take on more and more and more things and then we're overburdened and we're either cheating time from our family life or we're just stressed, stressed at work. So it took me a long time to learn that when you say yes to something exciting, you also have to say goodbye to something else to make space. Um, and I think the other thing I would say is um, to collaborate widely, that uh, working with wonderful people and they may be your peers who are going to move with you through, through your career, or they may be people at different levels, Working with wonderful people is one of the real pleasures of academia. And in child and adolescent mental health, we have such a breadth of disciplines and expertise that you can really have such an enriched career by working with lots of very different people. Um, and I think that's one of, one of the real joys. Thanks very much, Francesca. So the importance of mentors is just vital, really, isn't it? To find somebody who can promote and support you, but also the importance of saying no as well as saying yes. Thank you. Um, moving on to Rhonda, what's your perspective? Yes, um, one of the things I think is important, I, um, I am a first generation college student, so um, I was learning a lot as I was going on my career journey, um, trying to figure it out as I went along. I still feel like sometimes I'm still figuring it out at some points, but um, one of the things I think is important looking back is actually exploring things early on, getting a diverse of experiences, internship volunteers, different research, clinical experiencing. So you can hone in on your passion because our career can be long in um, clinician or clinic and you want to do what you love to do. And so really figuring that out early on and having that time to explore, I think is really important. I was kind of on a track where, oh, I have to do this next, next, next. And um, I, I just saw the next path and not really figuring out what I wanted to do to kind of later on um, once I actually got into a faculty appointment. Um, but um, I do think, um, I do appreciate that. I do think people are spending more time early on doing those things. Um, another point I also think is really important is actually um, oftentimes when I interview people for different like postdocs or internship, they mention this split of 50-50 clinical and research. And knowing now that that is actually not realistic in a lot of ways. We, most people do not spend like 50-50, like during a week. Um, and at many times that may vary across your career. Um, so one of the costs of doing a lot of clinical work, even up to 50%, is that it's harder to do research. And I think people don't really explain that to you early on. Um, and so I always tell people, if you wanna lead your own research, to do the research first. 
because you have to get the grant funding, the papers that established um, and focus much more on your research, um, particularly if you're doing a community-based research, health disparities research, that takes time to build relationships in the community, trust, you may need to do different recruitment and research methods to genuinely capture the population that many times is underserved. Um, and so those things that you do for that type of research is often actually not even counted in academia. Um, there's a lot of back work. Um, and so I think many times when we talk about the institution needs to be able to acknowledge that kind of work and the importance of those types of work. And you have to figure out strategies of how I'm gonna keep the numbers of my publications going up to make it when I do this type of work, when I may be helping an organization paint that day or so uh, because I need to be seen so that we can be able to um, kind of move on a path that I can do research collaborating with them. And so um, at that point, I used to kind of find people with data in other institutions across and publish with those senior. And so that helped me publish why I was doing sort of more community-based work. And so we have to kind of figure out different strategies. I do think the institution needs to learn how to recognize that kind of work. But I think in particularly women, particularly women of color may go to those um, types of research do populations that um, often are underlooked. And I think we kind of talked about those issues. And so it's not sort of seen as more highly esteemed. And But that work really matters to make a difference. So. Thanks very much, Rhonda. And I particularly like your point about making sure you follow your passion as well, because it's so easy to get sidelined, pushed into things that don't really mean much to you. And again, it goes back to Kathy's point about saying yes to the right things and putting yourself out there and making contacts with those people that are gonna be important to you. Thank you. And um, Pravitha, moving on to you. So what I'd like to have known, I think I already alluded to this earlier that I'd, I'd have liked to have known that there's still tons of discrimination and bias in the system. Uh, it came as a shock to me, but probably shouldn't have. Um, I was in this fantastical idea that the world would be fixed by the time I was a grown up. But I think in terms of like, to think about the things that we have to do, I think be prepared to speak up, question, complain, because if we don't, um, another hundred years will pass and the system will still be like this. And yes, it's difficult because when you speak up and you complain, you're considered problematic. But again, I think, the only way to sort of challenge the system is to constantly raise issue with it. And whether that means occasionally having to flag to your head of department that senior male colleagues have been sexist or other, you know, other things. I think we have to do these things because otherwise if we just try to keep changing ourselves to suit the system, as I said, 100 years will pass and it'll still be the same. Um, yeah, that, that, that was it for me. Thank you. That's a very quick point, Prithi. It's a very important one, though, really, isn't it? And I think the challenge is, particularly women starting out in their careers, how do you speak out without you feeling that you're being adversely affected by saying that? And how do you encourage other colleagues to speak out as well? And I think that's a million dollar question, really. Maybe I have time to come back to that. Thank you. Um, and next, Bethany. So I think the thing that I would have liked to have been told when I first started out um, as someone who's quite early on in my career is the importance as other people have sort of touched on is the importance of seeking out those female role models as opposed to sort of just waiting for them to present themselves to you especially during my PhD I've met so many amazing women and it's really improved my experience and I feel like they've helped me access other opportunities I wouldn't necessarily have known about otherwise and I think imposter syndrome is something that is really often spoken about in relation to women starting out their careers especially and I think having those role models is helpful to sort of shift that imposter cloud that hangs over people when that label is constantly applied to them. And I think, again, having those female role models can really help you understand and realise that you do belong in that role, you deserve it, and of course you're good enough for it. Something that I've struggled with is the fact that, so my male fiancé is on a similar career path to me. We have the same qualifications our achievements are very similar and through no fault of his in our sort of wider more distant circles his achievements are received in a much more positive light in terms of they're sort of taken at face value and there's the assumption that he would have those because he's a male of course he's qualified whereas my experience is quite different and there's almost a sort of tone of surprise or my my achievements are sort of discussed more so in relation to his rather than as my sort of standalone things I've achieved myself 
And it can be really frustrating, exhausting, constantly having to fight just to have the same level of recognition. So I think the other thing that's really important is remembering your worth. I think we're sort of conditioned to be modest as women. So I think it's really important to be loud and proud about your achievements because they don't they deserve to be recognized. Um, but not to be all sort of doom and gloom, while there are obviously issues and inequalities and injustices, I am still quite hopeful and optimistic that positive changes are happening. So I hope that young women do still feel encouraged and motivated to join this career path because it is really rewarding. Um, and we need more amazing women in it to make excellent things happen and to challenge those outdated misconceptions and break down the barriers that are currently faced. Thank you very much, Bethany. Again, reinforcing the importance of self-belief and the need to put yourself out there. I guess one of my questions of that is how do you stop yourself from being a so-called shouty woman? Um, because that's another issue that happens, doesn't it? Thank you for that. Um, and then Clara. Thank you. Um, so I'm still very, very early, like really early on in my career. So um, I'm not sure if that advice would be very valuable, but well, one piece of advice I still tell myself all the time uh, is as other panelists mentioned, uh, don't be afraid to expose yourself to new situations, spaces, and even countries, especially if you are from a low and middle income country like me, uh, you should totally go for that conference, ask to be nominated for that award. Many conferences now are online, which helps uh, to reduce the costs significantly. And they also have bursaries for students. Uh, the more you expose yourself to top science and new situations, more opportunities will come and more inspiration and motivation you will have. Like Bethany said, I totally can relate uh, with imposter syndrome as well. My story is that, uh, oh, I also forgot to mention that uh, regarding networking uh, with peers and finding mentors, Twitter, academic Twitter is actually a great place to do that. Um, you will see that many academics have Twitters and they use it professionally. So it's really a great space. And my story about that uh, is that when, um, well, I have a Twitter as an academic one and um, ACAM uh, last year sent me uh, an inbox saying that, ask, asking me to help uh, to uh, uh, to uh, promote their award ceremony and asking if um, I want uh, asking if I had someone to indicate me to one of the award categories and then I instantly replied, but I don't think I'm qualified to that award category. I, I don't think I'm eligible because I'm I'm, I'm foreigner and um, I really don't think um, I'm the person you're looking for. But to sure, I'm going to to the, uh, to spread it out to my uh, followers, and then I double checked it with a mentor so uh, and this mentor uh, like really supported me and he has said no I think you're totally qualified for it I'm going to nominate you and uh, I ended up winning that award but my first thought was to think that I was not qualified for it so I totally can relate to imposter syndrome as well and um, I think that my advice would be despite having that uh, just like keep going you know and keep putting yourself out there even if it makes you feel uncomfortable because many good things can come out come out of that. Thanks very much for that. And I think um, you raised the importance of not how we challenge the gender bias by challenging our own internal cognitive biases. So I think that's where it needs to start really, doesn't it? Thank you so much for that. Um, and then lastly, moving on to Gloria. Yeah, I think as like a really, I think the young, uh, really young sort of careers, career person, I think my main advice again is to seek out mentorship really early on in your career when you know what you want to do. And I think for me, because I don't think I actually had that much time in child psychiatry, but I feel like once I was in for that one week, I feel like that was the thing I want to do. And I tried to seek out uh, mentorship and everything to, you know, improve my exposure to child psychiatry. And I think that definitely worked. And I now have the female mentor that is a um, child psychiatrist consultant. And I sort of work with her with some of the research projects. And I also go into a child psychiatry inpatient unit every week um, just to increase my exposure. And I think the main thing I would um, advise for young people is just not to be afraid to seek out for help. And even if you, you're not sure who to contact first, maybe just try for someone who's like really friendly. And and they will then sort of lead you to the right person and you'll eventually get um, some really great mentors. 
And also, once you've reached um, a certain level of your career, you can start mentoring people as well. So you can actually teach them what you've learned through your career. And I think that is really important, having both being a mentor and a mentee. Thank you. Thanks so much, Glenn. I think that's so important, you know, sort of peer support as well in the early years, I think, and, and at any stage as well. Thank you very much. Um, we have about eight minutes or so for questions. I'm going to go back to the very beginning, um, from the very first question that came, because it kind of draws in some of the points that have been raised. Um, so I'd like to put this to Pravitha and also to Rhonda. Um, so the very first question was, uh, what do you do if, you work, if you've got a sexist work environment? Do you just jump ship and go somewhere else? Or Pravitha, do you speak out? And if so, if you are going to speak out, how do you do it? And how do you do it in a way, or, or is that going to be detrimental to your career? So I'd like to get your take and maybe Rhonda and anybody else who wants to come in on that one. I think you speak out, but also equally living in a sexist organisation for a very long time is very hard. So you also try to leave. And I've done both in my career. So I was at Liverpool for a while, which has one of the largest gender pay gaps, um, which I think just reflects a much more sexist institution than UCL where I'm now. And I spoke out all the time, but equally, when the opportunity came to leave, I left. And I, um, the how, I think, as um, Cathy said earlier around, there are ways to say no that are nice. I think there are ways to speak out that are also nice. Um, not nice necessarily, but that are respectful and highlight the problem without sort of um, getting into, you know, personal attacks and things like that. So I've, I have unfortunately have had to do many sorts of like, sort of reporting colleagues for saying ridiculous things in my career um, and I think as long as you sort of polite you record exactly what happened in writing pass it on to the next person um, sort of head, head of department or whoever is sort of next in line who needs to listen to that I think usually it's fine it's led to some very interesting conversations with senior colleagues who said these things and why they said them and them apologizing for sort of not realizing how, how sort of sexist that was. And so I think it's not, it's not necessarily always led to sort of negative things. Often it's led to quite sort of, you know, sort of not nice, but sort of interpersonal um, conversations that have been sort of illuminating, I think. And that's, I think, another important thing. Like if nobody ever points these things out to the people in the system, how are they to know, I mean, they are to know, like, they don't need us to point it out, but equally you could argue that us pointing it out, if we do it well, could be a constructive thing that helps the system. And this is both to people and to the system, right? So again, giving the example of sort of um, policies around maternity leave and things in Liverpool, there was a lot of discussion around sort of making these fairer, what, what happens to women who go on maternity leave, what support. And I think, again, you can speak out in ways that are constructive to try and make the system better, and equally, you could argue if nobody ever spoke out, why, how would the system know to become better? Again, you could argue that the system could become better without us having to constantly speak out, but somebody has to raise the proposition. Um, and I think raising the proposition is not necessarily something that flags you as being a troublemaker. And sometimes being flagged if, as being a troublemaker is not necessarily a bad thing if it's things that you're you sort of the convictions you hold strongly and think you're making the system better. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers all the questions, but um, I think it's doable. Um, and sometimes it may not lead to positive outcomes, but if, if you're in a place where they don't appreciate you speaking out or trying to make the system better, then maybe that place is not for you and you should, you know, and then you leave. Uh, but I think to answer that question, you try both, you try to fix it the places you are at all times but if the place starts to bring you down you also try to leave. Thanks very much for your thoughts Pravita and can Rhonda can I just get your thoughts on that um, about you know speaking out and the benefits or dangers or risks of doing so? Um, yeah I mean I'm one who hasn't spoke out about things um, and so I do recognize the, the importance of doing it. Um, oftentimes what I've done is I've strategically moved myself into different groups. Um, so I didn't stay in situations in which um, worked with people or collaborated with people who I felt 
um, was an uncomfortable environment or was um, not respectful. So because I'm in a large um, institution, I was able to, part of it is helpful when you can make, do your own money, do your own thing as you move in your career that I could kind of stop working with certain people and go um, work with other um, people. Um, there are sometimes you feel like there's dangers um, of speaking out. I think um, there's more protections probably than I felt like I, there were earlier in my career. Um, and um, But there are some consequences. Many times our fields are small in many ways. And so um, people talk. And so you do have to balance that. But I do think it's important to be able to stand up for rights. Um, and so I was just able to kind of move myself out of those situations, um, but stay in the insane institution. So not stay in a toxic environment. Um, but that's not for everyone. And so I think people need to figure out what's best for them. Um, and I've stayed at the same institution my whole um, career, um, which is probably unusual <laughs> these days. Um, so, um, but um, I find that I can do a variety of things. So that's my perspective. Thanks very much. It is a difficult call, isn't it? And it depends on individual circumstances. And I guess this is where the importance of mentors and peer support is really important as well. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Uh, we don't have much time left. I'm just going to pick up one very, very quick point from the ch chat. And there's been some chat around part time working and the difficulties of doing that. So um, I just wonder, Kathy, do you just want to just comment very quickly on that before we come to closing statements? Um, women who are in part time positions, how can they juggle that and get that right and still be able to advance their careers? Do you have any thoughts around that, Kathy? Two, two quick thoughts. One is, um, I'll go back to childcare. I mean, really, childcare is so, so important. Um, and you may be able to work more hours than you think if you have really good childcare that you absolutely trust. Um, and the second point about part time working is one that has been raised by many others. And that's to make sure that your colleagues absolutely support you. So, I mean, you might be in a job share. And, and really make sure that that's working well. So it's we are, women are really good at getting support from other women, and several of you pointed out from men as well. So I think really you know line up your support as a part time worker because it's hard. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap that up. So um, before I hand over to Gordana for the last few words, I'd just like to thank all our wonderful panellists. It's been a really interesting discussion. It's so great to get such a wide range of perspectives from people at very different stages of their careers. There's been some really positive advice out there as well. So, you know, feel, feel the fear, learn when to say yes, learn when to say no, seek the support of other people around you, the right mentors, the right peer support. Um, and don't be afraid, and you know, don't be afraid to challenge, you know, in the right way. Um, but that gets Kathy. It's easier to say no and say to you things that you know you don't have time to do if you really believe in yourself. So you have to really celebrate how good you are, and that makes it easier to say no. I think. Thank you very much. That's back to that whole thing about self belief and challenge challenging our own cognitive bias at times and those immediate thoughts that come in. And thank you to those of you who shared your personal experience as well. So I know that was really valued by some of the people listening in today. Um, so just before I hand over to Gordana, I guess I'd just like to say that, you know, we had a discussion before we hosted this webinar about our own association, um, the Association of Childless and Mental Health. So obviously it's really important we get our own house in order. Um, and I think we will be discussing this webinar at our next exec board meeting as well. But we did do a quick trawl just for information. We did look through papers that we published through the organisation. Um, and if anything, there was a slight female preponderance in terms of authorship, in terms of first authors as well. So we, we've got a relatively good balance in terms of our editorial board and in terms of our publications as well. But that's something that we do need to monitor closely too. So thank you very much for listening. And for the final two minutes, I'll hand over to you, Gordana, for the last words. Thanks, Bernadka. It's been such a privilege and honor to be part of this webinar today. And I'm like you, I'm proud to say that that uh, gender makeup of ACAMS 
office, board, editorial teams is a balanced one. But we, we can't um, just relax. We must continue to maintain that balance by uh, juxtaposing our appointments against intersectionality characteristics. We are currently upgrading our equality and diversity policy and any comments or edits would be most welcome. And I, I'm very much aware that we have a global participation and attendance, um, not only from our members, but from a, a much wider audience these days, given that we've been online uh, for so many of our meetings. So we must remain uh, globally aware of the issues which are going on uh, in the world. We've just published a position statement on the situation in the Ukraine and uh, it's on our website. Uh, but we must strive to overcome uh, wider inequalities and opportunities across the high income countries and the middle and low income countries, uh, be it on a gender basis or any other uh, characteristic. So um, that's as much from me and please stay in touch with uh, ACAM and our events and I look forward to seeing uh, some of you again uh, in the future. Find out more about becoming an ACAM member and to be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.